nothing really prepares you for entrepreneurship. Even if you've done an MBA or like even if you've done the best university, when you are faced with like real life problems, you don't have enough data and you still have to take decisions. I did not say to the investors like, oh my God, come here, we're gonna make lots of money. <laughs> That's the opportunity. I was very transparent to say 90% you're gonna waste, there's a 90% chance that you're gonna waste your money. <laughs> We feel it. Even if we sometimes can't put it into words that something is off here, like we mm -hmm. feel when people are authentic or when they're not. Hi, guys. Excited to welcome you today to episode number three of the Future of Skills podcast with myself, your host, Nadia Berke. And today with me, I'm having Elena Opra, who is the founder and CEO of Self Talk, a mental health app democratizing access to cognitive behavioral therapy. It helps adults deal with emotional conflicts by offering them therapy audios that emulate a one-on-one -on -one session with a therapist. She also wrote a book on the science and practice of self-talk phenomena and how it can be used to regulate our mental and emotional well-being. So let's welcome today Elena. Welcome, Elena. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you, Nadia. I'm really happy to be here with you and share a part from, uh, from my experience and, uh, and also see what interesting questions you've got. And thank you for being curious. It's all about the curiosity here, isn't it? And that's one of the core visions uh, of the Future of Skills uh, podcast, whereby we're encountering, and the curiosity being our driver, we're encountering what are the skills that are relevant in the age of AI. And therefore, self-talk to me, especially after reading your book, which I think I'm fortunate to, and I've got it here as well. It's called as we know, it's self-talk. Yeah, so I think the image is appearing quite nicely here. It can be found on Amazon. And it's got all sorts of um, quite intriguing ideas around um, how do we talk to ourselves. There we go. And the first, the usual question that we're asking our guests is, tell us a little bit about yourself, Elena. Who is Elena Opera in three words as summed up? If I would choose some words, definitely one of them would be analytical. Um, this voice I have in my head, my self-talk, was always quite uh, active. And uh, sometimes I think it's um, more like it's more active than the average person. <laughs> it's, it's, I would call it uh, analytical. So I'm analyzing a lot. Fair enough. Another word I would say creative. I used to not identify myself as like being creative in any way because I always was interested in science and mathematics. Um, mm. But lately, as an entrepreneur, I discovered that I have a quite a creative side and I express that through writing a lot. And I hope that the third one would be funny. <laughs> so let's see that. <laughs> So you've got analytical, creative, and funny alongside. That's a very good choice of words. Thank you so much. And you've alluded to uh, just minutes ago to your creative skill set um, and your writing skill set alongside. Can you let me know? And that's not necessarily the next question that I've prepared for you, but because you have incentivized me, I'm thinking what might have appeared first, your writing or your um, urge to um, investigate the entrepreneurial spirit? I think my urge to investigate the entrepreneurial spirit. Um, I grew up in Moldova uh, and, um, you know, it's a poor country. So I always dream to be rich <laughs> and who is rich? You know, entrepreneurs are rich. So my seven years old brain uh, figured it out very fast that uh, uh, that should be the path uh, I should take. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I looked forward to like have my own business and also I was quite excited about the freedom, at least the freedom I perceived uh, that there is the, mm -hmm. out there when you're an entrepreneur. Now that I became an entrepreneur, I understand that it's totally a different thing than what I was uh, expecting, but um, it definitely gives uh, a sense of freedom and um, that appeared, I think, very early in, in my life. Fair enough. And now that you're talking about your motivations as to what has been the prerequisite before you have launched the entrepreneurial career, you've had a career in the city, you've been in London, we've actually worked on a joint project together on DreamUp's tech community as well, um, trying to um, counsel the young entrepreneurs. But before you would have made that step to become an entrepreneur, what has shaped up your career in the city, in London? Mm -hmm. 
So yeah, um, I can start a bit even earlier. Like uh, when I chose my university, uh, mm -hmm. I chose it in mind, like, oh, what should I do so I can become an a good entrepreneur? And uh, I chose marketing <laughs> because I wanted to learn how to sell. Um, mm -hmm. And also I chose law. So I did a double degree, one like one in marketing and another one in law. So just so for me to know the, the regulations um, on like how to manage my business. This is how my, my teenage self was thinking about my career. <laughs> so uh, I did that. And um, right after university, I started my first company that was in Moldova. It was a sustainable mm -hmm. marketing agency. And it failed me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I after yeah, it sounds really nice. Sustainable marketing agency. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I had this uh, Erasmus uh, course in Germany and I learned sustainability marketing. And I was fascinated by the concept of sustainability. And um, yeah, I was like, I'm going to go back to my country and I'm going to open this uh, sustainable marketing agency. And Moldova have not seen anything like that before. So I came with a new concept and uh, six months into it, I got a burnout. I realized I don't know how to do marketing. I don't know how to do business. So I decided to move to London. And in London, I landed a job on a, on a startup. Um, mm -hmm. Later, like after a few months, the startup failed and I moved into this company that was developing digital products. Mm -hmm. And they had the, they were developing digital products for corporations, but also for startups. And initially, I was hired as a marketing assistant. But later, I transitioned naturally to the position of ventures manager because that position was was like uh, was not occupied by anyone. And I started to do tasks from there. And I think in three months, my uh, my my uh, ex boss he he was like, oh, but maybe you take this position and you just leave the marketing tasks. And I was like definitely give me this manager position <laughs> so, opportunity. yeah so for three years i used to work with startups there um ma mainly helping other founders figure out their business uh, side of, of the startup and the product side of the startup in mm -hmm. london we had a team of uh, um, you know, business people that would help figure out the business canvas model. And we would have a team of developers in India and Romania that would build a product when it was well defined by the team in London. So um, that gave me a great exposure and helped me build some skills that were very useful for me in my own entrepreneurial journey. And I can manage, I can mention some of those skills. First of yeah. the first one was fundraising. Um, and, you know, at the base of this fundraising skill that I, I, I integrated was a good mindset about money. Like my mm -hmm. um, the person, the people I used to work with, they trained me really well to think that there is an abundance of money out there. People want to give money to the startups. It's just they, they need capable founders that can multiply those money. And with this mindset, for me, it was not that hard to fundraise because I was always focused on... Um, on having the vocabulary, having the strategy, having, uh, you know, the plan very clear for my investors. So they are aware what are they investing in and what are the steps I'm taking. So um, that was uh, the first part. And the second part was validating a business idea. Um, mm -hmm. Fair enough. Yeah, I we used to follow, we used to do design thinking workshops uh, for mm -hmm. founders to help them validate and, um, you know, figure out um, like what are those blind spots that they may have and uh, that helped me a lot with my own entrepreneurial journey because we did a lot of validation and right now we have the product out we are quite um, like we have early signs of product market fit i would say maybe we have some onboarding issues like some bugs here and there mm -hmm. but because of that initial validating that we have done earlier um, that saved us a lot of uh, hustle <laughs> later down the line that's so that's what I the journey <laughs> Thank you so much. It sounds um, generally impressive. Um, it's, um, you know, helping you along the way to acquire those skills, as you said, that were absolutely uh, imperious in your um, position as a venture manager, where you were helping the other startups, I suppose, in order to either fundraise money or to become a little bit more established in their roles as, a, you know, founders of their companies. And that has then enabled you to come up with an idea later on and knowing where to start first when you're setting up your own company so yeah. that leads me nicely to the next um question and we have a little bit touch based on that because the the question that i had for you prepared was given that we we're discussing self-talk uh what made you leave your well-paid job in london to launch a well-being startup dedicated to self-talk 
Um, yeah, that's a good question. Sometimes <laughs> I'm asking that myself too, <laughs> in some bad moments. <laughs> uh, so yeah, mainly I was, um, as soon as I got this like well-paid job and I started to have talks and, uh, you know, write content, uh, I started to, you know, my, how can I say it? M you know, all my uh, logical answers to be happy, they were ticked. Everything that I suppose that will make me happy, I was kind of ticking it, you know, one by one. Good uh, job in London, nice boyfriend, uh, you know, excited, like excited about what I was doing. But internally, I was missing something. And I started to search. When COVID started, I had enough time <laughs> to start. A lot to of people woke up in COVID, didn't they? <laughs> to, be, to be sincere, like with all the, 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 the tragedy that was happening, for me, it was one of the best times of my life. So... <laughs> So I started to search this, like, um, you know, start to ask myself what's happening. What's my concept of happiness? Why I'm not happy if everything logically um, told me that you should have been happy right now. So um, so I turned to therapy. <laughs> and uh, at, I met some therapists uh, before COVID. And uh, when I asked one for like a quote, they were like, oh, 250 pounds for a session. And I was like, oh, my God, I need to break the bank to sort all my problems. <laughs> so I started to read more and kind of like I, I started to do some therapy, but I felt the need for more. And at some point I signed up for a therapy course. So it's a, it was a one year license from a very well known hypnotherapist in uh, in uh, great in, in London. Um, but not only it's a worldwide uh, person. It's, her name is Marisa Peer. Um, and she she's specialized in this this part of like people not feeling good enough, and that right. was my topic. <laughs> so uh, so yeah, so I I did this one year license, and during that course, I realized that actually what they teach us here, it can be easily be transformed into an app, and people can listen in and apply it by themselves. So they should maybe sometime, yes, it's amazing to have a, a, a real therapist, a real human being that's paying attention to you. But some of the concepts for people that can't afford, they can apply it themselves. They just need the explanations and the guiding. Right. So this is how mm -hmm. Soft Talk was, uh, was started. Um, we wanted to build uh, something like Spotify, but for therapy. So same that I listen to my favorite music on Spotify, I can listen to what the therapist would say about specific challenges. Let's say if I go for a breakup, I can listen to what the therapist would generally guide someone that goes for a breakup. What are those stages that I should go through? And only that awareness makes our journey with these problems much easier. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, that's definitely so, I believe. It's when you uh, are on your search for yourself. So you're basically digging a little bit deeper in terms of what's missing. What are some of those gaps that you're trying to figure out what might be relevant for the others? And that's where your idea for the startup, I presume, is coming along, right? So it's trying yeah. to fill some gaps at the time that you're doing so for yourself, right? So that's uh, yeah. the link up in between. Um, yeah, totally. And that's... Uh, that that's definitely uh, resonating um, totally with how I'm hearing you know the stories piling up when setting up your own ventures, but in terms of um, the next question that is residing from that is which skills did you have to acquire before you have decided to launch Self Talk? Now you have alluded to a little bit into that in terms of taking a little bit more of a course from Marissa Peer. Was there anything else that you felt was missing that you need to become a lot more proficient in? So I would say the first skill is to master the mindset. Uh, entrepreneurship, it's a lot about being open to integrate new ideas, new mindset, and to be very flexible in terms of your own mindset, to change and adapt to how things are like progressing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the skill that I really it was not that well developed initially but i like i involved a lot of effort to develop it was listening in terms of listening to the customers listening i would start with listening to myself uh, you know you, in, initially as an entrepreneur i was i was having the tendency to listen to people that have more experience than to listen to my own gut because mm -hmm. i was not trusting my own gut um, you know, in, I would be like, oh, but maybe they know better because they've been in the industry for 20 years. But right. what I learned with time uh, was that listening to my own gut feeling 
it's such an important skills and when when you when when i started to do that i could also listen to others in a better way so that's the first i would totally recommend uh, listening to our gut skill and you know sometimes if we are in contact with like what's happening inside and we do not block emotions and we do not have this like very negative harsh self-talk then that gut feeling can help us a lot to navigate uh, situations when we are not prepared because nothing really prepares you for entrepreneurship even if you've done an MBA or like even if you've done the best university when you are faced with like real life problems you don't have enough data and you still have to take decisions and what's helping what I learned very in very hard lessons is to trust my gut feeling because I had many situations when I have not trusted it and I wasted sometimes even half a year to like test different ideas and stuff and come back to my own option that I initially generated. It was like, oh my God, this is the right one that I should have done from the beginning. So um, yeah, that's the, that's the first and the most important, I would say. For me, at least it was. Another skill I would, uh, I would say it's uh, having, like being able to organize things or like structure things. What helped me fundraise was a well done plan. Uh, that was very well built in Miro with like nice colors and like very precise, very well explained. So structuring things and using, you know, uh, using tools that can allow you to show the big picture of whatever you are planning to do helps your investor kind of understand what you're talking about because it's age. It's only a well done plan that helps you kind of convince investors because they do not, uh, they may not, not made, they may not trust the idea, but they may trust your way of dealing with things and planning and your like you as a founder, they, they trust that. So structuring and being having a very clear thinking, that was mm -hmm. the second thing that helped me a lot. The first 50k that I raised, I raised them not on a pitch deck, but on a plan on a four months plan, how I'm going to validate the idea. And I've separated it in like three big stages, competitor analysis, uh, scientific validation and practical validation. And I explained it very clearly what we are doing at each stage and how they are connected and how after this like four months, we are going to take a decision if we continue it or not. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm saying that I'm moving into the first third skill that's transparency. Um, that I applied that with my team also, like I was very transparent of what's going on. I did not say to the investors like, oh my God, come here, we're going to make lots of money. <laughs> That's the opportunity. I was very transparent to say 90% you're going to waste, there's a 90% chance that you're going to waste your money. <laughs> and I'm not validating <laughs> the idea. I'm not sure. And I was very clear about it, that I'm only validating the idea. I'm not sure we're going to move forward after those four months. But it, without me investing these four months to find out, we will not, we will never know if it's worth pursuing this idea or not. And I only took like 50K. I was like, give me 50K first. I, I even took 20K first. Like I was like, just transfer me 20K first. I'm going to, this is how I'm going to spend them in this next four months. And after that, we go to get like we get together, all of us, we consult other people and we take the decision, should we move forward or not? Or we just uh, we just end it up here and maybe we pivot to a different idea. And also I gave some options on where we can pivot. So transparency is the third skill and it comes with a lot of courage because sometimes you have to show that you don't know all the answers. It's tremendous what you're saying um, in a sense that it's um, it's quite laid out um, and, and it's quite well organized, I would say. And um, it also shows to me, at least uh, it creates the impression um, so that um, you come forward with such an approach from having this type of experiences, again, when uh, helping some other um, founders or potential founders in the past, when instructing them, hey, you'd rather be realistic with what you're putting forward in front of them and not, you know, flourish anything and make it sound or look too glorious, but just rather make it a little bit more practical from that perspective. And that yeah. probably resonates with not only the founders, I'd say, and I'd probably push the, the note further, but also resonates with the employers who might want to, um, you know, um, engage with uh, future employees and uh, see who are they actually interacting with. So that's what the interaction yeah. purpose is very convincing, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. You know, people have a radar for authenticity. People feel it and they are more willing to 
to discuss things, to give you like the, the trust is, is built differently when you are authentic. And that's quite cool. I resonate with what you're saying because it's often the same feedback that I'm getting when consulting my graduates from University of Birmingham or the other solicitants who are willing to see how do they navigate through the career ladder. So from that perspective, um, an immediate question that I would have, and it kind of piles up from what you're saying and it stems from there, is um, it's probably for the benefit of um, also the beginners, the younger professional who are just starting up. So I'm not sure, be it the founders, be it the ones who are actually just starting in their career. Do you think authenticity can be learned? Definitely. Mm -hmm. I learned it myself. Where to start? <laughs> Tell them where to start. <laughs> um, first, it's about being sincere with our own mm -hmm. selves. Um, and, uh, you know, it's... Um, not being authentic it's not something it's not our fault it's not someone's fault that they're not authentic or not um, as uh, babies as children uh, we have two main needs being authentic and connection and if we are growing in an environment that cannot fully meet our needs then what we usually do is we give up authenticity to maintain connection with our caregivers so if someone doesn't know how to be authentic right right now, it's not um, it's not something bad. It's just a adapt like it's a coping skill that we mm -hmm. had to integrate to deal with whatever was happening in our childhood. And um, this is why I'm a big promoter of therapy because in in therapy you have this space to learn and understand where back in your childhood you gave up authenticity. And also to explore those moments, to acknowledge what other skills you've got there, what other gifts you've integrated in those moments, because every bad thing that comes has a good side of it. And I can definitely um, say that. And this is the whole point of therapy, to learn, to teach us to look at things differently like than for like only the negative side, but also to teach us to see the positive side. So what, what I'm recommending is self and like doing this uh, analysis of ourselves and to understand where we gave up authenticity and integrate those moments and learn or like reconnect with that person like with that younger self of ours that gave up authenticity and kind of reteach ourselves on like how to become authentic and also that it's safe to be so because mm -hmm. we did not uh, give up authenticity from a good reason. Like we gave up to keep our safety. And we just have to relearn that right now it's safe and we can express what we, what, what we need. And there is no need to, to maintain this lack of authenticity that was keeping safe back then, keeping, keeping us safe back then. So it's, it's a way of relearning how to be authentic. And there is lots of ways to do so. You can do that through like, um, you know, journaling and learning about yourself. You can do that through therapy. There are apps like self-talk. There are like many other like options, group therapy, just talking to friends. Um, there are many ways of regaining that. But it takes the willingness to to put your, like to, to have this courage to do something that's not familiar. Mm -hmm. And sometimes authenticity may be scary because you've lived maybe 10, 12, 20 years of not being authentic. So right now, even you may not know who, who are you, you know, what's the real side of you. That's Which absolutely is. true. I mean, there's a lot to uncover still. <laughs> yeah, but it's a journey. We should, uh, yeah, we should, we should, as long as we know the source of it and when mm. we have self-compassion, that thing, then things may go smooth. But when people are not aware, like even if I was not aware of this, it would be I would be really hard on myself. Like, oh, can't you be authentic? Can't you just do this? Can't you just do that? Without understanding what's the real reason behind this struggle. Uh, when we understand things, like we have this compassion that's needed to, and the, you know, the patience that's needed to relearn this skill. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fair enough. Um, it's the case of, as you say, uh, self-discovery, right? And it's the route to do so through being compassionate um, and being a little bit more patient towards yourself, which is quite a skill in itself. Um, in terms of, so, so you're alluding to this journey in terms of how you've come up with the idea as well. And that's basically the topic of the next question too. But um, before we go there, um, I assume another um, 
element that you've uncovered throughout your journey before you have set up the self-talk app was to figure out what are some of the core issues that um, the youngsters are confronting with that they need to acknowledge why self-talk is important. What is the definition of self-talk as well? So, so before we go there, can you please start with trying to define what is self-talk? Yeah, so it's a phenomenon that's happening in all of us. And, uh, you know, uh, initially when I gave this, uh, you know, this name to the business, people would say, like, isn't it a problem that I talk to myself? <laughs> like, like, aren't people that talk to themselves crazy? And uh, no, they're not. Like, it's, it's only a problem when we are not aware that you generate those voices. <laughs> That's your voice, you know? <laughs> only then becomes a problem <laughs> that you're not aware that that's your own voice. So, you know, in general, the, the phenomenon of self-talk, it's very well researched in sport uh, performance. Yes, uh, I've read top, in your book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, top athletes like Serena Williams, um, you know, Michael Jordan, they, they used to have self-talk coaches. Because whatever you, you say to yourself during a game or like in general, whatever you say to yourself influences your hormone, your hormones. So let's say you start talking uh, really bad to yourself, it grows your cortisol. And sometimes during a game, you may not need your cortisol to grow. So um, sports psychologists, they have this uh, methodologies to teach their, um, their students, the athletes, uh, to do instructional self-talk or motivational self-talk. And that's a very well uh, that's very well uh, uh, shown in the, the movie King Richard, the movie about the father of uh, Serena Williams. Mm -hmm. uh, you will see there how she, he was like programming her daughter that she's a world champion, and at some point her sister her sister was playing and she started to have this like doubts and her her hand started to to swallow so she could not play. So it's a very clear example of how self talk works. Um, and, you know, like this phenomenon, I learned about it from sports psychology, but I had my own, like I decided to give this name and, and I decided to start to research this phenomenon because I struggled myself with a lot of negative self-talk. And after my last breakup, my <laughs> boyfriend at that time, he told me, please never, ever talk that bad about yourself in front of a man. And I was like, what? What are you saying? I'm not talking about myself. <laughs> and I, I used to like forget about it, but at some point it came back to me. I was like, am I talking that bad about myself? And I remember like, and I could, of course, I started to be aware of this voice in my head that was constantly judging me, judging others, being very, you know, like, and I start, I started to invest a lot of time in like debating it and like asking, is this real or not? So I started to really like question my own voice. So mm. noticing those problems started with me having a problem. I remember me not going to the prom in high school because I was like, oh, I'm not sure my dress is going to fit me well. I'm not looking good enough to go to the prom. And I did not go to the prom. So like I started to like look back into my life after that phrase from my ex and I was like, Maybe I have a problem with my self-talk. <laughs> Let me research that. So um, uh, when I started to research it from a scientific way, I started to see that it's the cause of, of lots of mental health issues. And, um, you know, the way we talk to ourselves, the way we address, the way we believe or like this voice um, generates a lot, influences our behavior. Uh, mm -hmm. If I... If I say good things about myself if i'm having this motivational self-talk i may go out more often i may be more willing to try relation like different relationships uh, but if it's a more negative self-talk i have more cortisol and in general when i have high cortisol uh, i tend to stay isolated and perceive the outside world as dangerous and i stay more closed in and if you'd see right now we do have a problem with loneliness Mm -hmm. because people are less willing to connect with others like they are catched a lot in these negative thoughts about oh this is dangerous this is bad that's bad uh, this may be hurting me and uh, they connect with others less and less so the phenomenon of self-talk has a lot of implications for our mental health and it's very 
there is a problem there that's confused with this toxic positivity or like self talk affirm or like self affirmations that you do you tell to yourself in the mirror it's more than that it's much more than that and uh, i hope with this startup uh, we can make that aware that such a small thing we can learn how to talk to ourselves as a therapist teaches us to do when i started to do my the first time therapy I loved how my therapist therapist talked about me. I was like, I should uh, have this type of, uh, you know, therapist self talk uh, about myself. So this is where this is what motivated me to to name the company this way and also research it deeper. Very interesting. It's um, it's a uh, coming up with um, this thought of yours of um, a was detrimental to ourselves in terms of you know the negative thoughts that you've mentioned that would uh, generate cortisol the hormone of stress uh, i have indeed take a few notes from your book because you've mentioned there are a set of three hormones out there that are uh, called the hormones of life there's dopamine there's oxytocin and serotonin um, yeah. and oxytocin is the hormone of love so uh, to your point thinking good about yourself trying to portray those good thinkings over the others and then again transmitting those positive uh, uh, vibes as we call it right but at the same time um, uh, the cortisol hormone is becoming more detrimental so uh, putting uh, one connection to another there's almost this um, affirmation that comes in the end saying that when you have more of the love hormones in you or the hormones of life as you call it you tend to live longer whereas when you have more hormones of stress you, you shorten your um, lifespan is that the case yes. is that what you come across it as well is. Yeah, yeah, it is the case. You know, um, uh, your immunity is lower when you are in, you have a lot of cortisol. Over time, I was looking at some studies, and over time, the brain area that deals with positive thinking decreases from high cort from constant high cortisol. So, mm -hmm. so our brain is changed uh, by the hormones like we are generating, and at the root of this, it's our programming that like our blueprint that we've got from childhood and also the way we manage it right now so the way we are like we, we are dealing with ourselves are we very harsh on ourselves or we have a more compassionate way um, and you know i wanted to add something about this self-talk it's a lot about how serious we take it because it's a normal to have negative thoughts it's absolutely normal like people have more negative thoughts than than positive uh, this is what kept us uh, kept us alive. Like being paying attention to negative news kept us alive um, back in the in the days when we were living in the jungle and stuff like that. Because if I would walk in the jungle and like I would hear a noise, if I would think that oh it's just like a, a bird, and I would go on, I may have risked to be eaten by a lion. But if I would think negative, like oh my god, may maybe that's a lion there, uh, and I would go back, this would save my life. So over time. This trained our brain to be inclined to be more negative because this is what kept us to survive. But right now it's not the case. And we have to be aware that we are prone to negativity. The thing is that we should not be that much attached to what we think. Like it's okay to have negative thoughts. We should just not believe that, oh my God, this is the absolute reality. My thoughts are like for sure definitely the absolute truth. They are not. This is just they are coming from our, uh, you know, usually we integrate this voice from our parents. So it comes with a lot of uh, a lot from our childhood and also from the media that we consume, from all the information. And the, the solution is not to definitely like change every single negative thought that we are having, but to be less detached from it. Like, oh, it's just a negative thought, you know, like you have a stomachache sometimes. Some my our mm -hmm. mind can have a bad day, you know, sometimes. And that's OK. Yeah. See, you're you're talking some interesting and making some interesting points here in terms of uh, being detached from the negative thoughts, right? Uh, there's also another saying I've heard somewhere: um, negative thoughts don't necessarily need to be your, yours, uh, in a sense that you might be hearing, um, you know, clues from all over is the factors that are influence, influencing your thinking, but don't necessarily need to uh, take them on and without a filter per se, right? More so in your book, I've made a note and that left me thinking. Um, it's um, it's a phrase where you're saying, according to the psychologist Rick Hansen, PhD, 
study, the amygdala, our emotional brain, uses about two thirds of its neurons to look out for bad news. It's like, yes. you know, that yes. little bit more of a search box. Okay, let me see what's out there in your head, yeah, 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 yeah. what's negative so that I can, you know, feed into it, which I thought, woo, woo, that's weird. And if that's the case, that's really raising a lot of um, conscious thinking and yeah. something that you yeah. need to take action on and wake up that it's actually detrimental to the yeah. body as well yeah it, it is and it, but the body does it for a survival it the vibe yeah it's, it's a survival purpose that we are having mm -hmm. behind it and you should just be like oh that's okay i know i'm inclined to negativity uh it's fine and whenever i have a bad like a very negative day i just take my time See, that's interesting because, uh, you know, the next question from here that I had planned for you was, can our thoughts be dangerous? Now, as per our discussion, they clearly can be dangerous. The question is, how much do you think they can be dangerous? Can they lead to um, lethal, um, you know, outcomes? What do you think? Definitely. And uh, you see the um, you see the uh, rate of suicide, especially among uh, young uh, people being very high. And um, mm -hmm. it's it's a problem. One of the causes is this like very negative self talk that's not expressed. That's not uh, they don't talk to anyone about that. They feel that they're not understood. It's so much going on in their mind, and they do not have a person to feel safe to open up with. So, mm -hmm. so definitely, they can have very bad impact uh, onto us. Um, you know the most. Um, the most basic example I can give here, just think of a, of a football team. And, you know, uh, they like let's say we have two football teams playing a game and both of them, they put a lot of effort uh, into the game. And by the end of the, of the game, a team is the winning one and another one, they lose. And those that win, they can go and party all night because they have great self-talk and this great self-talk gives them a lot of energy, like they are full of you know they are full of life and the ones that lose because they have this idea in their mind that they lost maybe they are very tired they don't feel like connecting with others they even if you'd force them they would not be able to have that much energy as the winning team and the difference between them at the body level both of them are as tired because they mm -hmm. both play the same game what changes their state is their self how they think about themselves so, um, so it definitely, I would say, the quality of our self talk determines the quality of our life. So, and then with this example, is very clear in what way you can have great self talk, encourage yourself, uh, have you know, increase your energy level, take a break, be more compassionate, or you can have this very bad self talk that increases your cortisol level, gets your body more tired. Uh, gets you less open to connect with others, to explore the world, to play with others. Like I would say play um, in a way that adults do, like, you know, explore with curiosity the world. So in case the self-talk is very negative, we don't do that. Right. Mm -hmm. See, you, uh, you're you making a connection nicely to the prior um, guest that I've had in the show, um, who is a uh, MasterChef UK finalist, uh, Anurag Agarwal, who probably might be listening to uh, this recording later on. But he made um, a nice um, um, intro into the fact that there are two types of food that we as humans consume. One is for our operational, meaning the actual body, the flesh, and the other one is uh, for our subtle self, as he said. Oh. Now, the subtle self is not, yeah, it's not the type of food that you would consume on a regular basis, like, I don't know, tiramisu for your, you know, dessert or a soup for, for your first type of uh, dish, but it's more of a, what type of uh, food do you consume from the information that you're taking on, what's around the, the multi-screen environment that you're consuming as in the form of content. And then uh, immediately when I saw your post on LinkedIn uh, later on when you've been announcing the launch of the book and uh, making this allusion to the purpose and the vision of your brand, I thought that talks quite nicely to what we've just been discussing in terms of the type of thoughts that we get from the triggers that we consume in form of content. What would be your thoughts in terms of how detrimental can be certain types of content to us when forming certain negative thoughts? Yeah, I would say the content is really important. Like if you would, um, if I would compare the period of the, the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. I used to, I started instantly to watch all the news and I, I could not work from the stress. 
And after some days, I decided to stop reading the news. And I started to connect with the nature. Um, and my, my quality of life changed instantly. And now that I look for like back them two years, I can say that the, the, that, that period was good for me because I, start, I stopped reading the news that were like so stressing. And you see, um, like, you know, reading those bad news would increase my cortisol, lower my immunity, increase my chance to get COVID. Um, and, you know, like, and considering that our mind is prone to listen to, to like look for bad news, we can't even control ourselves sometimes to, 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 to look for this like bad news. And this is how the media works right now. Like they get more clicks if, if the news are shocking and somehow they can catch the mind uh, through fear and like through, through all, or, all sort of, sort of tricks. Um, so, yeah, I would say it has a big impact what we consume. It's same as with the food and what i'm uh, i want to like talk more about is mm -hmm. how much in this day we really treat well the body and like whenever we it happens something to our body we we have this diet industry that takes care of everything what we say we have these apps to exactly. measure our food um like we have all these sport programs for the body and it starts to be in a similar way for the mind uh, mm -hmm. because the mind can happen it can happen to the mind in the same way to have some wounds to have some like stuff that it's painful for for the mind and i hope we uh, this generation we we start to pay more attention to the mind and to uh, choose what we consume in terms of information same that we choose our food that we consume for the body so um, so yeah my concluding thoughts here would be that definitely what we consume shapes our first our internal chemistry like the hormones that we are having and also shapes our behavior as a result because mm -hmm. let's say you read about the economic crisis and like the job losses and and then like you know you read all these negative things happening out there and you may choose to maybe not start a business uh, and some others they, they do not read about that they just passionate about solving a problem they may start doing doing it and like without even being aware that there is something that bad going on. So what we consume influences a lot our behavior. And uh, I would be very uh, paying a lot of attention to what goes into the mind uh, because later down the line, it can impact the way we behave with our kids, with ourselves, the way we take decisions. Fair enough. And that's also quite a good skill uh, these days, taking decision. About that, we'll have another episode later on from Mark Randolph, the CEO of Netflix and the co-founder, the first um, the first CEO and the co-founder, who was talking about the decision-making um, skills. Now, in terms of um, what you were alluding to earlier, the, um, the types of techniques that one can have um, in place in order to be able to trace the thoughts and then shape up uh, or map the beliefs. Um, I know that in the book you've also made a reference to how you can have a journal to trace the thoughts how did that work for you so yeah so when i started to do therapy um, i would uh, take note of whatever was happening inside me that i would notice that's weird and that would start with my limiting beliefs or like the beliefs that i thought like oh why do i think this way like oh um, life is really hard or like oh i should not do this and that and i start to question it um, so I, I started to take note. Oh, I think about money that they're really hard to make. Or I think about men that you have to pay attention. <laughs> or like, and I started to take a note so I can discuss them with my therapist. And uh, later down the line, that turned into like a whole journal of keeping track of my thinking patterns. And mm -hmm. something surprising that happened, I used to keep a journal for, for some time. And... Um, after some years, I, I came back to it and I was shocked how bad I was talking, like how many, how stressful was that period. And I could see this progress in, in, in the way I talk in my journal, like real data that I was gathering. So seeing this progress in the way we, in the way our thinking evolves is very important. First, to build compassion for ourselves and also to not be that attached to what we think. Even my mom noticed at some point that, oh my God, your thinking changed so much. 
<laughs> like you used to think totally different when like five years ago. So keeping track of that gives us this detachment from what we think right now, because I'm not very attached to how I think right now, because I know in the past I changed quite a lot <laughs> my thinking. So this gives me more ease about the way I think. And also um, this um, openness that these things may change, the way I think may change in the future. So tracking these thoughts uh, to see, because we forget a lot about like, you know, me five years ago, but when you track them, you can see, I have a digital journal um, that I can go and see what I was writing in 2017. And like, that's a crazy emotion. And I hope like in five years, I can come back to this point. And at this point, I may be able to see the videos already. <laughs> But just seeing the way my thinking evolved, this gives us a lot of insight on like how we are evolving and where we are coming from. Um, also, what an interesting thing that I learned from my co-founder, Viorica Vanika, she interviewed her mom and she asked her mom to keep a journal mm -hmm. uh, so she can see what type of thinking patterns she adopted unconsciously while being a child from her family. This blew her mind and I, I got so inspired by this that I asked my mom to do the same. So I can see how her thinking was trans like transferred to me and I in like as a child I just adopted it because children are like sponges. They they just integrate whatever. And that information is stored in our subconscious or our unconscious mind, and we are not even aware that it runs our life. And what's happening in therapy, sometimes we are like we are going back into that unconscious mind to uncover some dysfunctional thinking patterns that are dysfunctional right now, but they may were not dysfunctional 40 years ago when our parents were growing up <laughs> or, like, uh, or like 20 years ago. They were maybe very good for that point and they kept them safe in the communist uh, system. And like it was great to think that way back then. But right now with a capitalist environment and with all the social media, with all the innovation we've got, that those thinking patterns they become limited like they become obsolete so we have to update them but first we have to become aware of them and the way to become aware of them is to track it to write to do self-reflection uh one very useful exercise or like uh, idea that came to me was to do this vipassana meditation thing like 10 days not speak with anyone just meditate 10 days just you and the voice in your mind to finally observe what's coming from out there. So this is not a mainstream thing that you do. It's not very comfortable to stay with only the voice in your mind for 10 days to meditate in a retreat in, <laughs> uh, in the countryside. But it's such a useful exercise to learn about ourselves, to do this personal discovery, because transformation happens only through personal discovery. Nobody can transform you or like change you or, or do anything to you till you don't discover something about yourself that transforms the way you see yourself. So, um, so yeah, I will leave you with these thoughts that like tracking or mapping the way we think in time, like having a history of like how we were thinking a few years ago and how that changes over time. It's really, really an important thing if you are into self-discovery journey. And if you want to learn about yourself and, you know, usually some people may be like, oh, ignorance is bliss. And I used to have friends like that, like if ignorance is bliss, I do not want to look into the past. I do not want to remember anything. And yes, ignorance is bliss sometimes. But as soon as you reach your basic needs, you know, the Maslow pyramid, mm -hmm. as soon as you Weird reach enough. your basic Sorry to interrupt, honey. Uh, weird enough, exactly that reference to the uh, to the Maslow um, theory of needs was made by Anurag <laughs> early on. So it kind of seems like this source, main source of traction. Yeah, yeah, it is because as soon as you 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 reach your basic needs, you start looking for love, acceptance, and the, at the highest point is self actualization. So ignorance mm -hmm. is bliss where you are meeting your basic needs. At that point, you do not need to self-actualize yourself. You do not need to look into your past, to look into what's your mission and like what's your purpose and stuff like that. But as soon as those are reached, you have the money, you have the food, you have shelter, and you have maybe a partner uh, and you have this uh, you know, house, you live a good life, you start to think, oh, but what's my purpose? Uh, but what I'm doing here, <laughs> why, who am I, you know? This is naturally, this is naturally happening. So at some point, uh, that stage is going to come to almost every one of us if we reach that uh, basic needs. So um, tracking these thoughts, it's helping us a lot to learn about who we are 
and uh, to just kind of gain insight on what makes us fulfilled, what may have potential to make us fulfilled in terms of uh, uh, what our job, our friendships, like what in general, what we want to do with our lives. And Elena, you've given me such a full-on answer on this question that uh, not only it has uncovered more curtains to look under <laughs> or more carpets <laughs> to figure out if there's something that has been brushed under, but it certainly has from the perspective of oh, we're full of secrets, aren't we, as human beings? It, it's um, an, an enormous um, river of all sorts of um, memories that we've got, all sorts of, uh, um, you know, uh, luggages that we've put on the side yeah. that we're not necessarily carrying alongside anymore but um, there's a reason why they're not necessarily put on on, on a day-to-day -day basis on every single shelf out there to um to catch and look into um so the the question that you're inspiring me is uh, when keeping track of your thoughts are there any key questions that you feel we need to answer to ourselves everyone here can follow different uh, you know different uh, ideas different questions what i use to ask myself all the time is how do i feel mm -hmm. uh, because yeah. usually we are not uh, i'm coming from a space where i used to ignore emotions like i used to think bad about emotions like no nah, you should not be emotional it's that bad makes you weak huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah you're weak yeah um so for everyone has their own journey some people are too emotional and maybe they should look into the reason more mm. and like okay what was the logic so depending on like What's your background? Like, what's your personality? For me, asking myself about emotions and how I feel, this is what I lacked. So uh, now I'm exploring this side. I'm letting, I'm learning myself to feel my emotions um, mm -hmm. because I used to just block them like, oh, they're not good. And when you block negative emotions, you also block the positive ones. So you kind of get numb. And a lot of people right now are numb. They block, they protect themselves from feeling the negative emotions. And in the same time, they lose the joy of feeling those, the positive ones. And um, that's the risk of staying in a very safe space. But that's only happening because we do not have enough inner resources to deal with whatever is happening. And our vision at Self Talk is to help people discover these inner resources that help them become resilient in, in the face of any negative emotion that can overwhelm us for a while so we've built this tool where you can listen in to a guiding to a guided uh, audio like that would guide you through this emotional turmoil that sometimes may come upon us and we may not even understand what's happening because we are not used to pay attention and teach and like taught about our emotions how to deal with them in the end emotions are just some signals it's some data that's coming from our internal world it's nothing good or bad uh, it's just data and we should treat it as data and as soon as we learn about them we are not making such a big deal like oh my god i feel shame i should have been i should have been the worst person in the world or i feel guilt i should hide away or i'm i have anger issues something is wrong with me so it's nothing wrong it's just some data that's coming that from your inner truth and as soon as we pay attention and we get guided on how to deal with those we learn that we have the skills we have the inner resources necessary to deal with almost anything that that come, that lies through through at us so um so yeah i would say uh, starting with where you are at right now uh, myself i'm starting with how i feel because i used to repress my emotions and at this stage in life i'm learning to feel them and i'm uncovering that side uh, but depending on like some other people, they may, the basic thing that you can do is like, you can go on YouTube, check some therapy videos out there. You can ask chat GPT, you can go in an app like self-talk that we have a list of questions that usually a therapist would ask. So mm -hmm. there are lots of sources out there. It just uh, takes a commitment to stay with the uncomfortable state and with the uncertainty to look inside us and also takes courage to look at things that's happening inside us that sometimes we may be scared of and i want to reassure everyone that there's nothing wrong with with feeling any specific emotions or like having any specific thoughts sometimes we even block ourselves to think some things because it's not okay it's not okay to hate your parents or it's not okay to do this because we are taught that you should be this way ideally we should behave this way it, it's nothing like that in our own mind 
we should just keep our curiosity that we mentioned in the beginning and just learn about ourselves same that we learned about a new subject and you don't judge it <laughs> like oh my god <laughs> this is good this is bad this is wrong this is this is good um yeah it's just a process of learning and welcoming whatever comes uh that's that's coming from like not a bad place most of the time all these negative thoughts they come from childhood events that we could not process we did not have the skills to process them they were overwhelming for us and we put in them away but there we integrated some ideas that are dysfunctional mm -hmm. so it's just a matter of time to explore them and to understand the root cause and when we understand the root cause we can liberate the tension between those conflicting thoughts that we are having that, that's mesmerizing. I feel like I'm on a therapy already, you know. <laughs> you're honestly, you're having this gift of um, explaining it in a in a, such a very light language that makes you understand, as you're saying, you need to look into the root cause and the fact that uh, you don't need to um, butt yourself for the fact that you didn't have enough skills in childhood to deal with some of the turmoil that you might be experiencing and that a lot of uh, issues are coming from that period alone. So, um, yeah, it's, it's quite eye-opening and I wish that uh, we, through our discussion, would have left uh, a lot of food for thought for those ones who are willing to self-discover and to self-actualize, as per your mention of the lovely uh, theory of needs um, and, and the fact that we need to continue to self-discover because it's a lifelong journey, wouldn't yeah. it? So, um, so it's, it's amazing that you guys are thinking about that and the fact that you have um, tried to not only self-fulfill yourselves, but also help others along the way so um, kudos to you guys for doing that i wish you all the best elena and um if there's one question that you feel we might have not um discussed today or we might have not touched upon would there be one and what would there be <laughs> uh i have a i have a question for you actually right. what's, the, uh, what's the why behind this uh this initiative that you've started because i think it's it's a beautiful initiative to be prepared for the future it's nothing more calming and peaceful than to know that you are prepared for whatever comes it lowers down a lot the anxiety that we may feel like anxiety gets to the rooftop when we have this feeling inside us that we're not prepared and i think like with the anxiety levels right now uh, it's such a needed initiative to be prepared for the future and i'm just curious what's your why uh, and why you started it thank you so much for the question um I feel that it's it's the two roots that have um, have inspired me. The root to um, obviously self discover in a sense that um, you know I remember watching this uh, this movie back in the days Circle with Emma Thompson. I think that was um, also Tom Hanks uh, as one of my favorite actors, and uh, she was trying to um, to pitch for um, for a role at uh, a company that was emulating Google uh, <laughs> as mm -hmm. part of the right and the question she was asked was um tell me what's your biggest fear and you know what her answer was unfulfilled potential right so that to me was quite an awakening um i'm sure that a lot of us are feeling that we're you know a, a, an entire fountain of knowledge to to one extent or another it's more of a case of motivation what comes at the back that you kind of need to surface those set of skills now the key here that I'm finding when it when uh, we've, we're having this opportunity to look ahead, especially now within the age of AI, is that um, certain skills are actually retiring, aren't they? It's the nature of things. And I'm sure that it's been the case with all of this you know, industrial re revolution along the way and um, and how our ancestors have, have been progressing, because that's the, the law of progress. It's what comes within. But how do we navigate through it? Because the current pacing that we're um, finding ourselves in is probably the fastest that the humanity has been in throughout the whole history of humanity. So uh, I think even uh, Yuval Noah Harari was uh, speaking about that in his book. That he was saying that this is the fastest ever speed that we've been exposed to data consumption in, in, the, hum in the history of humanity. So how do we navigate through that? It's not easy because the way that you need to adapt to knowing the skills and to retiring the ones that are no longer needed Again, you need to do it at speed, but at the same time to have a clear mind, you know, balanced view and not to get overwhelmed 
in this whole realm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a lot to it. Uh, I think we're only, you know, just starting the whole journey of trying to figure out how to best approach this. But um, the more I get into it, the more inspired I get. <laughs> <It's awesome. laughs> I love this. I, I really love this part of like, uh, you know, in psychology, it's called a shared human experience. When uh -huh. people are sharing what they, how they are experiencing things and seeing things and the other one is open um, to listen and integrate. And this makes um, life worth living for Friend. because we are designed for connection and meaningful connections like this they really dry, like they really at the base of those uh, happy hormones that I was mentioning in the book. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so, no, uh, I, I was just thinking that therapy helps us discover inner resources. And uh, for, for initiative like, initiatives like that, we also need the skills of the future. So we can uh, uh, engage those inner resources in the way that's aligned with like how things are changing. So yeah, I appreciate for you, for you doing this. And uh, I look forward to the session number 100 or something like that. Let, let's have some champagnes when, when the time will come. <laughs> Definitely invited to that one. Thank you so much for this. Really enjoyed talking to you. And I felt like, you know, I found more and more um, from, from our discussion today on top of what I've been um, reading in the book, which is amazing. I thought that the book itself, even though, you know, it's, it's um, not necessarily like, a war and peace itself but the, the the amount of information that you've got and the way that you've structured it it arises more um more willingness to dig deeper basically That's so, good. That's good. <laughs> so thank you so much for doing so and wishing you a great journey ahead of you with the new venture and hopefully you'll get that one billion minds to um to you know experience the self improved self-talk at a time <laughs> Uh, yeah, or, or, yeah, or die working on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Hope we get it uh, alive. <laughs> exactly right. Thank you so much, Elena. I'm wishing you all the best. Yeah, thank you. And uh, it was a pleasure.